Good to see you guys today. Hey, we've got ushers all over the auditorium to have Bibles. We'd love to put a Bible in your hand. Uh, honestly, today, most all of the scripture is going to be up on the screen. Okay, so I'd be lying if I said you really need to grab one of these today. But it's just kind of our practice and tradition, you know, as a typically verse by verse uh, chapter by chapter, book by book teaching church. But most of you guys know uh, we're doing a couple of topicals right now. Uh, we're in our second week this week on government. Uh, next week will be a fireside chat church. So you should come dressed accordingly, if you know what I mean, okay? Uh, and then we will start the book of Titus uh, the week after that. So we'll be starting the book of Titus verse, verse by verse. Uh, two weeks from this Sunday, and at least that is the plan uh, as best plans work around here, okay? And so again, uh, in case you haven't been with us over the last few weeks, uh, last week we talked about government. This week is a second uh, message focusing on government. Last week was kind of a foundation uh, to kind of a, just a, a starting point, uh, theologically speaking, in terms of should we interact with government in our culture as Christians? And then how, and kind of asking the question, how do the scriptures help to define that as opposed to just what we've taken in, maybe from the world or opinions or uh, whatever the case may be. And so this week is a follow-up to that. Uh, I'll only ask, you know, one thing, and, and even when I say this, this is never a demand. I feel like that's inappropriate to make demands. Uh, I would love for you to listen all the way through, because when you talk about government, it's very easy to get into places where you can kind of pick up and take off uh, if you hear something you don't agree with. And so uh, I would love for you to be able to hear the whole scope of today, uh, as well as last week, if you were not a part of last week. And then again, you are a free moral agent, so you make those decisions, but I'm open to conversation. I'm open to dialoguing about these things. Uh, nothing that comes out of me today, I don't think will be angry or intended to vilify or any of those sorts of things. And I'm encouraging us to talk about the difficult subjects rather than suppress them and not talk about them because it may be uncomfortable. And I want you talking about them in your small groups this week. I want you talking about them at your dinner tables and with your families and your kids and all those kinds of things. All right, so that's all I'll say about that and we'll jump in this morning. Y'all ready? Ready or not, here it comes. All right, let's pray together. Father God, thank you for this morning and the opportunity for us to be able to gather together with the saints for worship. And Father, we pray as we have many, many times before, and we ask that your Holy Spirit would fall on this place. Father, I ask that you would lead us into truth. I ask that you would lead me into truth and our church into truth. Father, I pray that you would reveal your word and how it impacts and affects our lives, our decisions, our voice, our actions, our interactions and relationships and, and every sphere of society, no matter what it is. And Father, we just confess that we live in a world of confusion. We live in a world of fear and, and anger and doubt and speculation and all kinds of things, Father. We ask that you would be the point of stability. We ask that you would be the place of unity in the church especially. And we ask, Father, that by the power of your spirit, that you would lead us to revival in our country, in our world. We ask that the Spirit of God would fall in power upon our churches first and foremost, and then it would spread out into our culture, and that you would redeem people and bring them into the kingdom of God in ways that many of us have never experienced before, but which you have done throughout the course of human history. And I pray that your church would get to be an influence, would get to be a part of that service and minister to our culture in any and every way that you see fit. We thank you, Father. We pray these things in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. All right, so the title of this week is mostly the same as last week. We're talking about God and government. I'm going to give you a subtitle this week. We're going to call it Stay Salty, all right? Stay Salty. In all the good ways, none of the bad ways, because salty can have different connotations in terms of its presentation. But I wanted to start you out with a quote this morning that most of you guys will know. Here's the quote. I may have used it before in the past, but it's it's this, and I want to encourage us not to be fearful again as we have conversations about these issues, because we know that fear typically is a bad, it's a bad basis to make decisions in our lives, and a wise prophet once said that fear is the path to the dark side. 
Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. <laughs> Said the prophet Yoda, right? It's in the book of hesitations. See, come over there. Oh, that's, that's terrible. Terrible. Like, I, I know. But there's some truth to that, right? Like, there's some truth into what we see going on around us. There is a great relationship between fear and anger. And can we agree that we show both a lot of fear and a lot of anger in our culture today? Yes or no? Man, we should all be able to agree on that. And I want to give you a few questions. I actually did this with you, you know, I don't know, six or eight weeks ago in a totally different subject. But I want to ask the questions again and just see if we have a general sense of agreement. Okay, these questions actually came from John Eldridge, but I asked you some similar ones again six or eight years ago. Is the world, you, you can answer this out loud or in your own heart, it doesn't matter to me, but is the world, in your opinion, is it seemingly growing more or less stable? Is it seemingly growing more or less stable? Is our culture continually, is it, is it seemingly embracing light or is it embracing dark? Does the short-term future, does it seem rosy? Does the short-term future, does it look promising or does it feel somewhat foreboding? Is the culture that we're living in increasingly make it easier to have a relationship with God or is the culture that we're living in increasingly making it harder to have a relationship with God? I just want you to meditate on those questions for just a moment, and I really believe that even with differences of opinion on how we go about things and how we speak about things in this room right now, I think the vast majority of us would come to a pretty good consensus on the answer to those questions. So how we interact with those things, how we interact with our relationships, how we interact with our families, how we interact with our government, how we interact with our jobs and, and every facet of society is important to consider in the direction that our culture is going. That's going to lead us to kind of a, a theme question, if you want to call it that. Not necessarily a statement, but a question and a theme verse that I'm going to share both at the beginning and the end this morning. And I'll share the questions like this. What is it that we can do as the church? Because my message is to our church, and I'm not speaking out into the whole culture. But what can we do as the church to advance the kingdom of God and slow the spread of evil in our land for the common good of the people around us until Jesus comes? Or until there is revival? And how does our interaction with government help to support that purpose? Is there a way that we interact with government to support the common good of people all around us, even if they're not believers, and to slow the spread of evil, making it easier to have a relationship with God in our culture? How is it that we do that? If I were to share this concept with you, those questions, in terms of a couple of verses, it would be in Matthew chapter 5. Here's, what, here's the exhortation of Jesus to the church in the Sermon on the Mount. And he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. In this context, salt is good. Salt is a preservative. Salt is a purifier, right? And I absolutely believe that in the church of Jesus Christ, we are to have a purifying effect on the culture in which we live. We are to be purifiers, we are to be preservers as a part of the culture that we live in. Then he gives another example, he basically says the same thing multiple ways, but in verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So in such a way as salt is a purifier to the culture around us, light gives light to the culture around us. It shines into darkness and it repels the darkness. Verse 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So a part of the premise that I'm approaching you guys with is not to, we will talk about some specific subjects today. 
But I'm not going to tell you how and what to believe about every single facet of government and every law and what it should look like and what should be codified and what should not and everything that should be law and shouldn't be law and punishments and consequences. And I don't even have all of those ideas worked out myself. I don't have the answers to all of these things just to hand over to you and say, this is what you should believe about everything. I don't have those, but I have been searching these things out for myself so that I have my own convictions about these things and looking past just what culture says, just what's on the news, right or left, regardless of the, the, you know, the name on the station or whatever, to see what I believe and what scripture I believe is saying about many of these issues. And as a general summary or conclusion of these couple of weeks, last week and this week for me, I simply believe that government is a way It is a way Christians can interact with our culture to be salt and light. I do not believe it is the way. I believe it is a way. Do you understand? And I'm a little bit afraid, again, of the message that we're supposed to sit on the sidelines. We're supposed to sit this out. And our voice is not supposed to be made known because we're trying to enforce our morals, our morality upon other people. And I think there's a lot of that voice that is out there today. So, last week I gave you purely a theological foundation. I, I would be dishonest with you if I told you that I felt like last week should be controversial at all. And so, if you had big pushback to last week, I'd be interested in what it is that we could actually talk about it. It was a purely theological foundation for it. Let's start the conversation here, and the boundaries should come out of scripture, not out of culture and out of society. This week, we're just going to go through questions. And I told you last week there would be some repetition between the two weeks. I can't. <laughs> I won't remember everything I said or didn't say last week, but you undoubtedly will see some repetition from last week to this week, but I'm just going to kind of present some extra information and some stuff organized in a different manner this week just by hitting some specific questions. So, here we go. Here's question number one. We absolutely covered this week, so I'm going to be very, very quick on this. Question number one, what is the biblical purpose of government? I gave you a couple of scriptural references right there. Last week, we went through these verse by verse, but the scriptural purpose of government is for the punishment of the wicked and the praise and protection of those who do right. That is the God-mandated function of government. That is what government is supposed to do. So part of my exhortation to the church was, let's go back and reconsider everything we believe about how the government is supposed to function, not by how we've seen it function in our country, not by how we're being told it's supposed to function, but how scripture tells us it is supposed to function. Let's allow the scripture to create the boundaries in our lives. And I'm not even saying then that we will all agree on what those boundary lines are, but let's at least trace the conversation back to the scriptures rather than simply what's been passed down to us. Y'all dig, right? That was kind of the idea. But that is the nutshell version of what scripture says. This is the reason government exists, to punish the wicked, and to praise and protect those who do good. And it even tells us the government is a minister. Government is a deacon to those who do the things that are right, right? That is the purpose, the biblical purpose of government. We also slightly got into the second question. The second question this morning, we slightly got into this one last week. Where have our ideas typically come from that Christians and or churches should actually stay out of the political discussion? And that includes pastors. Now, y'all tell me, are there some strong opinions about what pastors should or should not do when it comes to speaking about government and politics? You should laugh about that. The answer is 100% yes. 100% yes. I mean, strong opinions. And you're coming in with those opinions. And I understand that completely. My question to you kind of goes back to the first one. Where do your opinions come from? What what is the root of your opinions about what it is okay for me to speak about and not speak about and where the lines are that I should not cross, but how far maybe I should go in the leadership of the church? 
what is the root of how you got those ideas, okay? And again, that's, that's related to that first question in terms of setting the boundaries according to the scriptures. I'm going to suggest to y'all, and, and, and when I say this, I recognize there's a lot of different individuals in here. Y'all have to recognize I'm speaking to a big group of people all at one time. And so it's absolutely impossible to address every single individual background, right? But I want to suggest to a lot of you guys that the boundaries that have been created in our own minds and hearts really come from outside of the Bible. I want to suggest that they primarily come from an idea that came from a letter written by Thomas Jefferson that we refer to as, what do we call this? The separation of church and state. Which was essentially, that was kind of his restatement of the First Amendment you know, which kind of establishes the establishment clause of the free practice of religion and government not impinging upon that, okay? It was just different language that he wrote about. But, but I would argue that most of our ideas about what we can and should or should not talk about in the church actually come from the separation of church and state. They also come from the Johnson Amendment. The Johnson Amendment was something that was pushed by Lyndon Johnson, you know, I think it was, uh, what was it, mid-50s, helped me out on my, my history lessons here. I can't remember all this stuff. But, but basically, this is a part of our tax code. And essentially what it says is that no 501c3, no tax-free ministry, and no, including churches, which we are a 501c3, according to the tax code, we should not be able to interfere in any type of electoral process. In other words, according to the tax code, we would risk losing our tax exempt status if we were to endorse a candidate. Yeah, now, and, and I'll try to get even more specific. Specifically, in general, we are supposed to be allowed to even invite candidates to even take the stage at a church. But if I invite one, if I invite one party to come up, what am I also supposed to do? I'm supposed to invite the other. You're supposed to at least give them the opportunity to participate and they have the right to be able to say no or to say yes, right? Like this is essentially the intent of the law, okay? Now again, you may think that's good or you may think that's bad. All I'm simply arguing is that I believe most of the boundary lines have been drawn through politics and have been drawn through discussions over things over the years that are outside the lines of scripture. And I think I said this last week, okay? I am grateful for tax exempt status in a church. That means that more of our money can be used for ministry. And I would argue to you that the history of tax exemption in the church is the government existing for the praise who do of those who do right. It was, it was something that was granted to churches because what do churches do? Churches gather donation items for Hurricane Helene victims and send them out, you know, in huge moving vans. And they show up and they save people and rescue people and feed people and house people and adopt people. And like churches do those sorts of things. So, so I would argue with you the history of the tax exemption stuff is the government praising those who do right with their money. Can I also say to you, if the Johnson Amendment is a tool to control what churches can and cannot talk about, then I don't give a rip about the tax exempt status. Like, I don't, I don't care. It, it, it's money, right? And God owns the cattle on the thousand hills. All the silver and gold belongs to him. He will provide in the way that he wants to provide for the things that he wants to provide it for. I would also say, I would argue that the third thing that has kind of set the boundaries for us regarding church and politics is like grandma and grandpa. Y'all know what I mean by that? Tradition, right? Well, I heard this fact, my grandpa was a pastor and he told me, you never talk about politics. I, I've heard that more times than I can count in Cleveland, Tennessee, y'all, right? Uh, or, or mine said, you are, to, right? Are or aren't. My grandma said, my grandpa said, this is what they said in my church growing up. Like what, it, tradition is a big part of where we believe these boundary lines come from. And y'all, I'm, I'm talking out of personal experience here. 
Like I have been the one in the last few months who has been going back and saying, where do my thoughts about these things come from? Not what I've been told, not what other pastors have been said, not what people in the church want me to do or how they want me to behave or lead, not how my pastor in Chattanooga leads, not how they say or they say or that, but I want to read these things, I want to consider them, and I want to take them back to the Word, but that's part of my exhortation for all of us is to do that same thing. Now, I I don't know how far I want to go into all this kind of stuff, okay? The separation of church and state. I I just think there's fascinating context uh, behind all these things. Like like for example, the the Johnson Amendment, okay? The Johnson Amendment, some of the context, again, from what I've read and studied, if it's even accurate, part of it is uh, that Lyndon Johnson, number one, at that time, the US was afraid of a lot of communist propaganda coming into the country by uh, nonprofit organizations. And so part of it was a fear of communist propaganda coming into our country. Another part of it was Lyndon Johnson, when he ran for president, he had two pretty significant 501c3s align themselves with and endorse another candidate, you know, for office. And he was not happy about it, right? And so there's context behind that law and the, and the reason that it was put into place that's maybe a little different from how it's often used and even enforced in the day that we live in today. The separation of church and state. I've gotten the idea a lot of times that Jefferson uh, was trying to, to keep the church in its place, right? I, I've gotten the idea a lot of times that Jefferson was uh, a, an atheist. I've gotten, I've gotten a lot of different impressions about these things. Who did he write the letter to? He wrote it to a Baptist association. What what was kind of some of the background of the letter? That they would have the freedom to be able to exercise their religious practice without the government interfering with it in any, you know, in any inappropriate type of way. Jefferson, as president, now, now I'll tell you, Jefferson's beliefs were not all shared with me, okay? They, they were not. Jefferson, had, he was right, kind of, kind of snipping away and putting together almost his own version of the Gospels. And there's a lot of argument between, behind what he was trying to do. But Jefferson also would have told you that he was a believer. And even as the president of the United States, the third president of the United States, having written the letter, which, by the way, I don't know if y'all have time to go read that letter of separation of church and state. It's really, really long and in-depth. It's like a whole 25 sentences. It's a, it's a ton of explanation about exactly how the, the wall of separation of church and state is supposed to be worked out in our culture. It's not. It's, it's like a paragraph, right? It, it's amazing how much you know, controversy there is over it today. But as the third president of the United States, Jefferson was actually attending church services in the Capitol building, right? In the Capitol building. And so I'm not trying to argue that the church should have uh, complete sovereign control over the government because I'm also acknowledging that, that the founding of our country came out of the background of the revolution that was stemmed from a state sponsored church government coming out of England, right? It, it kind of cuts both ways. But, but here, here's what I am saying, okay? And, and I want y'all to know, I recognize that I have my own biases and opinions. Do you have your own biases and opinions? Of course you do, unless you're a liar. I have my own biases and opinions about how some of these things should go and the context behind them and what I think is a reimagining of some things. And, you know, uh, no doubt our educational curriculum has swung from one side to the other. It's a pendulum in academics and it has been for a long time. It's it's very, very interesting. But here's the deal. What, What I'm addressing is an attempt to silence the voice of evangelicals that's very prominent in my mind. I feel like I hear it in a million different ways today. And let me say something, okay? When you hear my biases, and you will hear some of my biases today, okay, and some of my opinions, 
Part of where I'm coming from is that when we talk about this balance of separation between church and state, I'm not arguing again that it should be an all-powerful church running the government and everything in our country. I'm simply saying that we are sprinting. We, we are like a fast and the furious race car hitting the nitro button towards a plural, pluralistic or perhaps completely secular country heading towards the cliff as fast as we possibly can, forsaking this other side of the conversation. And let me suggest to you that if our voices are silenced, and if, and if my take on this is not supposed to happen in this platform, that this is perhaps forsaking a check and balance in our country that's going to lead us to places that we don't want to go. Do you understand what I'm saying? If, if, this, if the evangelical believers and if the churches are supposed to be silent about this, then perhaps there's an element of real health in whatever this is, this separation of spheres like we kind of talked about. Given to Caesar what is Caesar's, given to God what is God's. If we silence this voice in the church, there's only one voice left, and now we're going to get way out of balance on this issue. Are y'all following me? I, I don't think we're supposed to be silent. Some of y'all are afraid we're going to talk about it in church every week from here on out. Man, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. We're about to go in the book of Titus, y'all. Titus, right? But I don't think we're supposed to be silent. I don't think we're not supposed to discuss it. I don't think there's a biblical mandate that we can't touch these things in the pulpit of our churches, right? And in fact, I think there's a double standard to these things. And I'll probably point some of that out and you'll say, well, that's your bias. Maybe it is. Maybe, maybe it is, okay? But I'll point some of it out as we go today. The other question I've been pondering regarding this thing and about this balance between us speaking out in the church. How many of y'all are familiar? I asked this question in my car yesterday where, you know, we took 25 Jeff Richardsons to the men's conference. Um, that's a joke for the people that went to the men's conference only, Okay. But in my car yesterday, I had like six guys and I basically asked them this question. How many of y'all would be familiar with this language if I use the language, the prophetic voice of the church? Put your hand up, let me see. Okay, all right, that's interesting. That, that's a pretty small percentage. The, the reason a lot of y'all are unfamiliar with that language is it's typically regarded to be language that might be used in more Pentecostal circles, okay? Like a lot of you that have come from churches that have not been Pentecostal, full gospel, you haven't heard that type of language before, but the idea of the prophetic voice of the church. Well, I've been thinking about that a lot as we've been doing the reading plan, right? Uh, the prophetic voice of the church is when, if y'all are reading the reading plan in 1 Kings, when an unnamed prophet, we don't even know the guy's name, but God raises him up, puts a word in his mouth and sends him to Jeroboam to basically to, to, to prophesy against the idolatry that's happening there and to say there's going to be punishment. It's a prophet with a message by God sent to confront a governmental leader because they're walking in immoral idolatry. And that happens all throughout the Old Testament, right? You're talking about all the prophets. And it's not even just specifically prophets, like Esther was a follower of God that God used to, to, to reach and to speak out and to influence the government around her for the purpose of the salvation of her people. And by the way, it's not just an Old Testament thing, okay? Is there, in a sense, a prophetic voice in the New Testament that spoke into governmental issues? Yes or no? Paul did it, right? Yeah, I mean, again, you can go read your, you can look this stuff up. I can't give this all to you today. Paul did it. Uh, John the Baptist did it, right? John the Baptist, I heard one person say that, you know, John ended a, a particularly uh, promising career in ministry by speaking into the government. <laughs> well, that's one way to look at it. That's one way, Right? But this is not just an Old Testament concept. It's not just a New Testament concept. But I believe that the prophetic voice of the church is there to be able to speak into our culture. 
And the prophetic voice of the church can be silenced. And I may or may not have shared this story last week. When, when, a, when, a, when I have a conversation with a Christian in Cleveland, Tennessee, who tells me if I came into your church and if I heard you use the word abortion or homosexuality or marriage or whatever, like these are political issues. Those are not political issues. Those are biblical issues which have become politicized. That's what those are, right? I can't dogmatically tell you what you should believe about every issue. But if I can trace an issue directly into the scripture, I absolutely have the right to speak into those and we should hold up those standards in our culture. And that is, I believe, a part of the prophetic voice of the church. And there's a risk that we're being silenced today. And we can't, we just can't do that. If we were gonna be silenced, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, most of you guys wouldn't know who that name is. That's the prophetic voice of the church in the Nazi Germany. Y'all glad for Dietrich Bonhoeffer? How about uh, William Wilberforce, right? A Christian who was greatly instrumental in the bringing down of the transatlantic like slave trade, okay? This is part of the prophetic voice of the church. We've heard that, that churches in the U.S. are a big part of the reason that slavery was even a thing. I would never tell you that there weren't pulpits and pastors who weren't endorsing slavery because that is an absolutely stone cold hard fact. But I often don't hear that much of the abolitionist movement was started and run by Bible-believing Christians, right? Bringing the prophetic voice of the church into the culture around us. Here's my concern, and I'll try to phrase it for you right here. And by the way, a lot to write today. All this stuff will be on the YouTube page. If you don't want to write it, you can go back and get it. My concern is the gaslighting of the church through the manipulation of information and new emphasis on certain sociological theories. And I chose the word gaslighting for a purpose. Like, what is gaslighting? Gaslighting is the manipulation of what you think is reality. It's the manipulation of your emotions and your ideas to reach a certain outcome. Now, can we also agree that gaslighting is happening? I don't care what side you're talking about. Is there a large element of psychological warfare in our culture today? A hundred percent. I don't even know how we can deny that, right? It just is what it is which is all the more reason to me that we go back to the word as much as we know how to do in everything to define boundaries and to see what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to behave. Speaking of these sociological theories, how many of y'all have heard the term, again, this is uh, audience participation right here and I'm genuinely interested, okay? How many of y'all have even heard the term Christian nationalism? Let me see your hands. Okay, man. You guys are more educated than some of our other churches in town, okay? Hey, no joke. I asked somebody, they, they work with a significant group, and, uh, and I said, hey, I want you to ask your people how many of them, you know, uh, know the term Christian nationalism and could define it. They came back to me. They said out of 38 people in a church, they said two of them knew the term and one of them felt like they could define it at all. And I was like, Wow. So if you don't know the term, you should probably get to know it a little bit. But uh, in my own words, Christian nationalism, it's very hard to define because like one pastor called it, he called it a plastic term. And a plastic term can be manipulated. It's like Play-Doh. You can make it into different shapes. You can add things to it, take things away from it, change it here and there and reshape it in the way that you want it. But essentially, what it is, is an outright accusation towards evangelical Christians that you're putting country over God in an idolatrous manner. 
That, that's, that's what Christian nationalism is. It is that if you believe that your faith is supposed to be a part of, of what makes this country go and affect the government and, and laws, and you know, like you are a Christian nationalist and that this is an inherent evil in our country and it is absolutely heretical, you're automatically a heretic. Uh, you pray towards Mar-a-Lago five times a day. And if you do, you are a heretic. <laughs> I, I'm just not saying that, that if you believe your Christian faith should impact your, your views on government, I don't think that makes you a heretic, right? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna provoke you with a term. I'm gonna tell you to go study if you have no ideas what it is, okay? And I'm just simply gonna tell y'all where we have decided that we stand as a church. And by the way, all of this that I'm talking about today has been discussed with our elders and our staff. So if you are furious about what I say today, go tell an elder. <laughs> Phone a friend, right? They're all on our website. <laughs> so here's what I would say regarding Christian nationalism, okay? I'm gonna tell it to you in the, in the thoughts that we reject, okay? I'm just, that's just how I'm gonna define it for you guys. We reject that evangelicals and churches should forsake participation in politics and government. We reject the idea. We also reject that America is a chosen nation in some sort of special covenant with God. We reject that patriotism and nationalism are inherently unbiblical and evil. Now, some of y'all are gonna have to chew on that one for a minute. You're like, what'd you say? Let's talk about that one for just a moment. Acts 17, verse 26. This is Paul's message to the Areopagus. And he said, from one man, every nation, uh, he made from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Now that's one verse among many that I could share you with you but the basic idea is that as a church we believe that on the authority of the bible whose idea was nations can y'all tell me god's idea okay we believe the nations were god's idea and not only that we believe that god has appointed nations to rise and to fall and we believe that God is authoritative and sovereign over every nation every king every kingdom every prime minister every throne every governmental leader that God is sovereign over them all now how many uh, fourth of July celebrations have y'all been to at the chapel how many? How many of y'all came to our last 4th of July celebration? That's because we didn't have it, right? See, because right here you get into all kinds of stuff, but we've got, what do you see over there on, the, on that side of the room, stage left? There's an American flag. What? No 4th of July celebration? You unpatriotic? Wait a minute, we got an American flag. You heretic? Where's the line? Where's the boundary, right? We're just simply saying, I think the boundaries that are being drawn for us are being drawn with an agenda. Let's go back and understand that. And we would actually say that, that the nations are God's idea. So desiring something good for our nation is not inherently wicked or unbiblical. Like if we want our nation to prosper, if we want our nation to be successful, are we gonna be vilified for that? I mean, you can choose to try, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stop desiring something good for our nation, right? Uh, is it wrong to be patriotic? I absolutely believe there could be a line where you could put country over citizenship of heaven. That's where heresy would be, right? But I don't think a general form of patriotism is a terrible thing. Now y'all think about this. If, if we vilify patriotism, where, where are we going to go? No, let me ask differently. If you vilify all forms of patriotism, 
with the recognition that we should never put country over God, right? And I'll share that with you scripturally in a minute. I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but I can't help it, right? If we vilify patriotism, where are people going to go? They're going to go to hatred of, right? Y'all, I saw this, and again, I can't remember if I said this last week. I saw this as a school teacher. And I think I did say it last week, but I'll say it again because there's, there's people in here that weren't here last week. I remember when I was in high school, I played sports. I was involved in school, but even the sports I didn't play, I wanted us to win. I wanted my school to win. I wanted us to be good. We went to pep rallies and we had fun, right? Like we made loud like shakers and we competed against each other but we wanted our teams to win and we show up and we painted ourselves and we wore our school colors and we had competitions we did all that kind of stuff and we wanted our school to be good at stuff by the time i was a school teacher right just maybe 10 years later i started watching my students turn and starting to show hatred for their own schools And it changed in a matter of like 10 years. I want y'all to think about this and to discern if we we start to live in a country where patriotism is vilified. Number one, if it is evil, show it to me in the scriptures. And if you can, then I'm wrong. That's the bottom line. If you can prove it to me in the scriptures, then I'm wrong. But if we inappropriately, absolutely vilify all forms of patriotism, we will produce generations of people in our country that hate our country. And that is the direction that we are going. It is the direction that we are going. And so in the church, we just got to try to find the balance, y'all, right? We don't want to put country over God. That would be heresy. We also don't want to vilify all forms of patriotism that would just be normal and natural and healthy. Last one I had on Christian nationalism. We absolutely reject that politics, parties, or presidents can heal our land. Do do y'all hear the balance in these things? And y'all, this is what we're striving for. This is what we're saying about Christian nationalism regarding our church. We reject that evangelicals, churches, and churches should forsake participation in politics and government. We think this is a way, a way, not the way that we can be salt and light in our culture. But we also reject that America is a chosen nation in special covenant with God. We think that's heretical. The Bible does not teach that. But on the other side, we reject that patriotism and nationalism are inherently unbiblical and evil. We don't see a foundation for that in the scriptures. But on the other side, we reject that politics, parties, or presidents can heal our land. We're striving for balance. I'm exhort- I'm not, and I'm not telling y'all, we're finding it in every place. That's what we're striving for, and we're exhorting you to strive for balance. And the dualism drives me nuts. You know, as I, as I talk about these things today, you will find me passionate and you will find me motivated and you'll find me to be strong in my beliefs. But you also know what I'm not calling for. I don't have the expectation that everybody else is gonna sit down and shut up about their beliefs. And it's just fascinating to me. One of my favorite examples, I say favorite, Maybe not appropriate usage of terms, but there was a viral message on Christian nationalism from a guy speaking in a church, speaking in a church who said his granddad was a pastor and he was in seminary, but he's a state democratic representative, okay? So he's a practicing politician Um, He's very clear on what he believes about abortion and sexuality and a lot of things that completely disagree with Scripture. And his whole message, without ever cracking open the Bible, was on the inherent evils of Christian nationalism only as applied to evangelical, Bible-believing, Orthodox Christians. And I, I detected like this hint of irony in the sermon. Just a hint, just a... I just kind of wafted it, you know what I mean? I think, I 
think I smell irony in here somewhere. I can't put my finger on it, right? It is not my expectation that that man is going to sit down and shut up. But his message to me was, you are spreading heretical, uh, heretical ideas about Christ, evangelical believers, sit down, shut up, stop imposing your morality on other people. Don't tell them what to believe. You should believe this. <laughs> oh, there it is again. I think I caught a whiff. I don't expect he's going to be quiet. I'm not going to tell him to be quiet. And I'm also not going to be quiet. Right? So moving on, another question. You're like, thank the Lord, moving on. How does our citizenship affect our interaction with and influence of government? This goes back to a theological foundation behind a lot of these things. And I do need us to understand because this combats some of the heresy that actually is involved in some of these things, right? I'm not saying there's no heresy spreading in the church. I think it's overblown, but this addresses what heresy there is. Philippians 3.20, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, tell me this very simply, where is our primary citizenship? Where is it? It's in heaven. If you are a born again believer of Jesus Christ, your primary citizenship and loyalty is to heaven and not nation, right? And that is where the primary heresy lies that we do need to be aware of. An example of this, to, to go a little bit further, how our citizenship in heaven affects our influence with like our national citizenship Jeremiah 29, verse 4, this is a message that God inspired through the prophet Jeremiah to the, the Jews who were in captivity in Babylon, all right? So the Jewish exiles in Babylon. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile in, from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives. Become the fathers of sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons, give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will have welfare. I think this is a passage we need to greatly consider in terms of our interaction with our government and our culture and our nation, okay? And there are two uh, exhortations in that last verse that I think we can apply. Number one, it says, seek the welfare of the city in which you live. See, this is an action term. That means there's stuff we can do, okay? That, that's what I mean here. There's stuff we're supposed to be doing. And then the second exhortation is pray. Seek and pray. Do and pray. And somewhere in there, we need to find ourselves in the church. But I don't think the answer is to completely remove ourselves from the culture and only pray. I think either one of these is not fully obeying this idea of how we can be a blessing to, how we can be salt, and how we can be light for the nation in which we live. Next question, because I know i got to speed up a bit. What happens when government is absent, weak, or immoral? Remember the purpose of government. The purpose of government being the biblical purpose to punish the wicked and to, for the praise uh, and the protection of those who do right. So what happens <coughs> when government is absent, weak, or immoral? And this is very, a very shortened version of this idea, but what we're gonna see is political, religious, and societal anarchy political, religious, and societal anarchy. And if you wanna see this, just go read those five chapters, Judges 17 through 21. What happens in Judges 17 through 21? Well, there's no king, there's not a really functional government structure that's operating in Israel at the time. Um, 
morally, you've got this concept where every man is doing right what is with it, you know, in his own eyes. He's, he's, it's relativism, okay? It's everybody gets to make up their own version of truth, which I told y'all is one of my huge concerns for the culture we live in today. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. I'll practice my truth as long as it doesn't impact your truth. Keep your truth off my truth and your truth is okay, right? That's some messed up stuff logically. It really is. And it's anti-gospel. It, it, that, that message of relativism is anti-gospel, okay? And Judges 17 through 21, the summary statement is every man did what is right in his own eyes. You got this dude named Micah that, based, that just goes and creates his own religion. Now, can you think of a more prideful and arrogant thing to do than to create, just create your own religion, right? You're like, well, Jesus did it. Yeah, well, he was perfect, okay? I can name some other ones that would be much more concerning that created one. This dude just goes and gets some metal, melts some stuff down, makes an image, goes and hires a priest. You got priests for hire to, to go ahead and run with this new religious practice. Then you have other people that are like, wow, that's a cool religion, I think I'll steal it. And they come and take it. You got holy men taking concubines. You got people mass raping the concubine. And then he decides he's gonna cut her up and, and send her all over Israel to show everybody how crazy this is. It is psychotic. It's anarchy, and it's political, it's social, it's religious, it's every man for himself, because it's every man doing what is right in his own eyes. That is the ultimate end of a government that's absent, weak, or immoral. And I think, you know, I, I'm not trying to peddle fear up here. There's, there's way too much fear happening in our culture today. But going back to the questions that, I, that I, I asked you in the very beginning, I think we all recognize that we're at least pointed in this direction today. We are pointed in that direction. Next question. What does the Bible say about the relationship between law and morality? I'm not going to elaborate on this much because I talked about it some last week. But as a reminder, Galatians 3.24 Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, okay? Part of my argument to you guys last week that I'll kind of restate a little bit today is that the further and further a culture goes into uh, relativism where everybody gets to believe in their own truth and there is no standard for morality, it erodes the foundational understanding of morality that prohibits evangelism. Because the law is supposed to demonstrate to us that I cannot be righteous enough in myself and through my own actions to have a relationship with God. But if there is no standard for morality, then I never recognize the shortfall, and so therefore I don't need a savior. Everybody becomes their own functional God, and it erodes the foundation for evangelism. All right? Now, now let me challenge y'all with something. If you don't see the impact of relativism today, that's because you don't evangelize. Did y'all hear me say that? If you do not see the impact of relativism, that's because you do not share the gospel. And if you start sharing the gospel with people, you will see relativism stamped on our culture all over the place today. Prove me wrong. And if you can prove me wrong, you're sharing the gospel anyway. So I win, right? Because <laughs> you're preaching the gospel. You're like, that wasn't true. I don't care because you're preaching the gospel. Gotcha, gotcha, right? You'll see it, man. You'll see it all over the place. First Timothy 1 verse 8. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. Why am I sharing that? Because scripture even tells us that laws, laws, not, not just the Old Testament law, but just laws in general, they are for the sinner. They are for the lawbreaker. They are for the wicked. That is who they are for. And we're all concerned with, you can't legislate morality. No, no, no. 
All laws teach morality. They teach us a standard of morality, okay? That's just a natural byproduct and function of what they actually do. But they also, we're not talking about forcing conversions in people. We're not talking about creating a civil law that is going to make people Christians, right? That can, the law and the government and leaders and politicians can't change hearts. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can do that. But what we are also saying is the law teaches morality and it restrains immorality. Laws, moral laws, help to restrain immorality by punishing the wicked. And what's one of the primary purposes of government? The punishment of the wicked for the praise and the protection of those who do good. And I'll show you this again here in just a minute. Now, what are some biblical issues that we should be concerned with today? Not every issue, not every issue that's a part of legislation, not every law, not everything that we talk about in government today, but what are some issues? Is it really 10 o'clock? You set that way ahead, that's a dirty trick. Okay, dirty trick. What are some biblical issues we should be concerned with? Well, I'm gonna give you a few right here. Number one, creation and enforcement of morally just laws. Creation and enforcement of morally just laws. All right, now, what does that mean even like voting-wise? That means that you should be very aware of who you're voting for, like in our Congress, our House of Representatives, our Senate, because what is the function of Congress? It's to make laws, okay? All right, and so I think we have an opportunity to engage with government to influence the moral foundation of our country through trying the best we know how to elect leaders who are going to promote, create and promote, hopefully as righteous laws as we can see there. We can't exercise all control over it, but we do have the opportunity to influence it through voting and election. Judicial appointments. This is related to the first one. Judicial appointments, those verses there are to provide you some support. And, and it's just essentially that, you know, where the leaders are evil, the, the, the country or the nation is going to suffer for it. You know, where there's more righteous leadership, the, it's, it's going to be more fruitful for the people who are led with more righteous leadership. In, in terms of voting and things, that's where president selections and where governors really come into play in a large way. One of the issues that we need to be aware of uh, with, when it comes to presidents and governors is, okay, what would their appointments look like? Because you're talking about hundreds, if not thousands of judges all across our land that influence the interpretation and the application of the laws in our land. And are they going to do it, hopefully, in as morally upright a way as possible? Okay? That's something we need to be aware of. Number three, Israel. Genesis 12, the foundation of the Abrahamic covenant, that in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. I'm not going to go into it a ton more because I feel like I've talked about it a good bit since, you know, since a year ago when there was that invasion in Israel from Gaza, right? Not an endorsement of every action that Israel ever takes. Israel, man, the Jews in Israel are lost. They need prayers for salvation. But that also does not negate the Abrahamic covenant, which was an everlasting promise. So I believe biblically it is right to align with Israel. Biological sex, sexuality, marriage, and family. Again, some scriptural support for these things. And I'm not just talking, I'm not just talking about homosexuality and uh, gay marriage and, and things of that nature. I'm talking about gender and gender confusion. I'm talking about the, the, the state and the, the, our, our, the way that we talk about the family and things. I'm talking about all of these things and allowing the scriptures to determine our stances on them. And when you talk about laws having a, a teaching function to teach morality, this is one of the huge places where we see it in our culture today. All right, I am 48 years old which means some of y'all think I'm Methuselah. And then some of y'all think, how are you a pastor? Like you're not, a, you can't even be qualified yet, you know, right? Some of y'all think I'm a child. 
But I am old enough to have seen, uh, when was the Obergefell case? When, when did that go into law? Was that like 2015? 2015, okay. In 2015, we're talking less than 10 years ago, uh, gay marriage was essentially legalized. Now remember, I told you guys it's hard to separate, separate out law and morality and that laws have a teaching function. Have you seen a difference in our culture since the legalization of gay marriage, yes or no? Now don't, don't tell me there's not a teaching function behind laws, okay? All right, uh, 10 years ago, and, and I know, well, this is gonna come out in weird ways, I'm just gonna say it. 10 years ago, you wouldn't watch Gonzo in drag on the Disney Channel. All right, but I can show it to you right now. 10 years ago, you wouldn't see a Blue's Clues Pride Parade, okay? You, you wouldn't see that 10 years ago. All right, now, now tell me, is, do we think that, do we think that is appropriate? Do we think that is, is biblical? Now, some of y'all hear condemnation right now. Man, I don't wanna condemn those who are, who are struggling and fighting you know, with these desires. But because there's grace and there's acceptance. I love my brothers and sisters who are fighting with those things. But I need you to look back into the word and to see what it clearly says. And I want you to know, I've read the arguments. I've looked at the articles. I've read the stuff. There is a reimagining of what scripture says towards the ideas of sexuality. And I want y'all to understand, this is nothing new. These are age old heresies that are cycling back through the church in different ways. And a lot of the stuff that you're seeing now, I understand that it has roots even farther back through the whole sexual revolution. Cause it's not just about homosexuality. It's not just about gay marriage. It's about redefining what is appropriate moral exercise of sexuality in every way, shape, form or fashion away from what what the Bible says is right and or, uh, ordained and established by God. And God is the one who designs sexuality and God is the one who has the authority to tell us how it is supposed to be practiced. And the more we compromise our laws, then the more it will educate our society in a way that is moving away from the standards of God. And it is to our harm. And it is to the harm of our children. It is to the harm of our society. Y'all, from my heart, this is not a message of hate. This is a message of love. This is hurting people. This is moving people away from the image and the design of God that he has given us for our fruitfulness and for the fruitfulness of societies. And y'all, this has been on my heart. This has been on my heart for weeks now. And it's not just to try to be even-handed or something like that. But y'all know how we talked about the prophetic voice of the church? Y'all know how I had that conversation, the prophetic voice of the church? Well, let me tell you something. Eight, 12 weeks ago, I don't even know, we worked through the story of, uh, of David and Bathsheba, right? And, and we didn't just talk about adultery. We went in, we went, in, we went all in on God's word and what it had to say about sexual morality and the expression of a biblical sexual ethic. And we talked about everything. We talked about everything. Are y'all with me right now? Now, let me tell y'all something. The sense that I got in, in our church when we went through that scripture and we went through it for weeks, the sense that I got in our church was, you know what? That's right. That's right. That's not your opinion. You showed it to us in the scriptures. You made a biblical argument for this ethic. You showed it to us. This is right. This is what God's word has to say about it. This is right. But do you know how many people I had conversations with about repentance, about their personal practice of sexual ethic? Do you know how many key people came forward and prayed? Do you know how many people reached out by email and said, hey, I need to meet with you because I need some help? Do you know how many people flooded our biblical guidance department with, with, with their own sexual ethics struggles? Do you know how many people confessed their use of pornography when the, script, when, when the research says that, that a vast majority of the men in this room are partaking of it on a regular basis right now? It was closer to zero than it was to 10. And so let me tell you guys something. 
If there's gonna be a prophetic voice of the church, then a part of the foundation will be the purity of the church. And there is no purity in the church unless we repent of the things that God says is sin and we walk away from those things and we put sin to death in the church. We mortify it. And that will be the foundation of morality from which we will have a prophetic voice in our nation. And so if we are a part of the problem, then our confession and repentance has to be a part of the solution. It has to be. It's not just about the culture. It's not just about telling everybody how wicked they are. It's not just about condemning everybody, right? It is us being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and walking in self-control, which is a fruit not just of your human effort, but a fruit of the Holy Spirit filling us so that we have a mastery over our own bodies, so our own desires don't tell us how to behave and tell us what to do, so that we walk in power and freedom and victory. And when we fail, because you will fail, then we run to the foot of the cross and we confess it and we go to our accountability and we say, I fell, I need you to lift me up. I understand God is forgiving me, but, but walk with me for a minute, talk with me about it and let's do something better than I've been doing before. Y'all understand? There's grace, there's compassion. It's for us and it's for the world too if they want to come to the cross. This is across the board. It's not one group, it's not one person, it's not one issue, it's all the way across the board. What other issues do we need to be concerned with? Y'all, we, we've got to protect the unborn. We have to protect the unborn. I want to share with you, th you guys some things that I reject, some common arguments, maybe call them apologetics, call them pro-choice apologetics. I reject that as a pastor, a Christian, and a white man, that I cannot speak my voice into the cause of the unborn. I reject that. I reject that being pro-life is, ra is a racist stance. I reject that. And I want you to understand that the founder of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, a white woman, was a factually established eugenicist. And eugenics is essentially the setting, the, the cultural direction for the encouragement of what they see a as greater advantageous genetic lines. That's what genetics, that's what eugenics is. Eugenics is why everybody in this room would agree that the Holocaust was a bad thing. Eugenics is why everybody in this room would agree that the Holocaust was an evil, morally depraved movement. And it is the foundation of the abortion industry. I reject the idea that having a pro-life pro view of the world, I think I misstated it on my slide. Y'all better be able to interpret what I meant. <laughs> I reject that, that being uh, pro-life lacks compassion to the women and the poor. I reject that idea. There, there's a, a new apologetic that's been floating around for a few years that says, it says essentially this, if I'm pro-choice, I'm more pro-life than you are. Right? Because this is struggle. This is poverty. This is lack of opportunity. This is a, listen, there are many simultaneous truths that exist among us that if we don't understand they can exist simultaneously, then we start to make some really bad logical errors. Do you understand what I'm saying? I would never tell you there's not gonna be struggle. I'm not gonna tell you that we're gonna be able to eliminate poverty. I'm not gonna tell you that nobody's ever gonna hurt, that nobody, there's never gonna be pain or suffering or death or disease. I cannot tell you all those things because in fact, the scripture tells us that those things will exist in our lives. 
What I can tell you is that God is decidedly pro-life. He is decidedly in favor of the unborn and that every single unborn child is created in the image of God. Regardless of what country they're gonna be born in, regard of the color of their skin, regardless of their nation or tribe or language or anything else, with equal value in God's sight to my own life on the authority of the scriptures. And if you wanna talk about our church, you, you can miss me with the whole, hey, I'm pro-choice, so I'm more pro-life than you are argument. Just miss me with it. We have tens of thousands of dollars going out to single moms, adoption causes. We have many families that have adopted, that are fostering. We're helping, we're paying mortgages for people and helping people that are struggling. We're trying to minister to our body and reach out to those who are outside. Let me say something really, really clearly. And this is not a pat on the back. This is simply the way that it is supposed to be. But this is what I mean by miss me with the argument. If every church in Tennessee were as pro-life as this church, there would not be a single child in need of a home in foster care right now. Not one. But listen to me. Listen to me. But I and you and we cannot be responsible for every other professing Christian, every other person in every other church that's out there. We simply do what God has called us to do, and we base our foundations theologically upon what God's Word says, and we don't get trapped in these weird logical arguments. We say we're about the business of pure religion. We visit the orphan and the widow in distress. We care, we show compassion, we provide needs. And we fight for the voice of the unborn. And church, let me tell you something before I move on here. Huh. Yeah. A lot of people in the church think some kind of victory was won when Roe was struck down. Hey, listen to me. There were more abortions in 2023 than there were in the years before Roe was struck down. That's a verifiable fact. Go look it up. More abortions now than before Roe was struck down. You can drive right through here through beautiful downtown Cleveland, Tennessee in a state where there is supposedly abortion bans in place. But you gotta understand the whole thing has changed. And it changed with medication coming in the mail. And you can go look up where to get it, do your telehealth appointment, and get it in the privacy of your own mailbox. You understand? If, if y'all think that the battle over the unborn is over, you need to wake up. It has only just started. It has only just begun. And if y'all are worried about endorsing parties and all that kind of stuff, I know how I'm going to vote. I'll tell you how. You're like, right now? <laughs> there ain't a party out there that's probably life enough for me. Hey, let me tell y'all something, okay? If we do want to only equate party lines here, you better watch yourself, Okay? There, there is no party out there. And by the way, if, if you haven't read the platforms, why not? Are, are you playing American Idol with your vote? If you haven't read the platforms? But let me tell you something. There is no platform that is even as biblical as it was four years ago. And there is no platform out there that's as biblical as it was eight years ago. And there is no platform out there that's as biblical as it was 12 years ago or 16 years ago or 20 years ago. So watch yourself. Watch your loyalties and hold some folks' feet to the fire about what they're going to do when they're elected into offices. Holy shnikes. <laughs> Last couple. I can't even get into these, man. I think we need to be thoughtful about our approach to immigration and the treatment of immigrants. I'd like to talk to y'all about that. I got an idea, I got an assignment for you. Here's your assignment. There are about 100 uses of the word alien, stranger, and sojourner in the Bible. Go read them. Like, oh, 
hundred. Real simple. Go to, go to Blue Letter Bible, okay? And go up to the word search and start with alien. Put alien up there in the top, do a word search. It'll b- pull up a concordance for you in, you know, one second. Bam, there they are. Just read through the scriptural exhortations in terms of the behavior of God's people toward the alien. Then do it for the sojourner, then do it for the stranger. I did it, all right? It won't take you all that long. And, and I would say that I found a couple of general excer- a couple of general ideas that I saw repeated throughout those verses that helped me to cultivate my ideas of what I think about immigration and the treatment of the alien and the stranger and the sojourner. Are you developing a biblical ethic on these things? Or are you watching news? Last one. Religious liberty, conscience, and freedom issues. I'll have to end here because we got, we got to flip the place. Clark Beach right now is having a heart attack. <laughs> you know, I watched a message uh, not long ago from a guy named Mike McClure. Uh, pastor Mike is the pastor of Calvary Chapel San Jose. And it kind of impacted me. And it, it was fascinating. I had all kinds of feelings while I was watching this message. He was speaking to a group of pastors, out, Calvary pastors out in California. And Pastor Mike is the pastor of Calvary Chapel San Jose. Some of y'all remember we prayed for them back during COVID because they're the church that was in the middle of the Supreme Court case where they were being uh, oppressed by their local government and the local government targeted them and told them they couldn't meet during COVID. They, they were trying to express their religious you know, right to be able to practice and meet together. And the government was, the local government in San Jose was fining them incredibly. I think, I think the number ended up over like $4 million worth of fines against the church for meeting. And I understand you could feel one way or another about all that. I get that. Okay, everybody's got opinions. All right, but um, that case went into litigation and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court ruled that they had the religious right to be able to decide to meet, right? Yay, church won, woohoo, right? they're still in litigation over the previously levied fines. And so the local government took the decision as, okay, so we can't find them anymore, but we will try to continue to pursue the fines that have been previously levied, even though it's no longer constitutionally just, right? Now, fast forward, they're still in litigation over like 4 million in fines. So fast forward to this message I watched a couple weeks ago. Mike McClure went off on everything, all right? Like, if y'all heard me today and you're like, that's some crazy stuff that dude was talking about today, that was so political, okay? Like, on the, on the political meter, if, if you think what I preached was so political, it was about a 0.5 and he was 100. <laughs> I'm, for, I'm for real now. Like, I'm talking about next level. I'm talking about he hit everything. If there's a hot button issue, he hit it. Like, I'm talking about like whack-a-mole. Bam, bam, bam. Like, you name the issue, bam, bam. By the end of this thing, he's like, the government's telling us cows are evil. They don't want us to eat hamburgers. And I'm like, whoa, woo. Like, I mean, he brought, he wanted all the smoke, right? That's what the kids say these days. And I'm watching this, I'm like, oh, I, don't, I don't know if I'd talk about that. I don't know if I would say that. I don't, I don't know if I would address that. I don't know how I even feel about that. Like, that's how I'm watching this message. Like, whoa, I got all these kind of feelings going on. But let me say something. By the end of the message, I started feeling a little more compassion for the dude. You know why? Because what if you've seen the level of control that he and his church actually had to endure? What if you've actually lived through that? And we got some brothers and sisters that have come in from California in the room, okay? I feel sorry for you guys. I do, because I know y'all come in the South and all these Southerners like me, they come up to y'all, they're like, what kind of Californian are you anyway? <laughs> like, are, are you the kind of Californian that like loves Jesus and wants freedom or do, or, or do you wear hemp sandals? Like, which one are you, <laughs> right? Like, those are the kinds of questions y'all get. But I'm looking at my brother Mike and I'm thinking, man, I don't know if I would touch any of that stuff with a 10 foot pole. And then I'm like, but I have not lived under the oppression 
that my brother has lived through. And it just made me wonder, uh, what do we need to think about? What do we need to reconsider? And I know that scares some of y'all. But listen, when you go look at the notes on the YouTube page, I'm going to tell you we're going to keep the main things the main things. My encouragement to you guys is not to forsake your participation in the political process or in the conversations that are happening in our culture, number one. Number two is to go out and be the church. That means let's walk in purity, let's seek the face of the Lord, let's grow in intimacy with Him, let's do evangelism, and the main purposes of the church will not be for us to be political every week. I know that's some of y'all's fears. We will exist to equip the, the church for the works of service. We will participate in the ministry of the word and in prayer. And we will promote the things that are the most important. And we will speak out as we feel like the Lord leads us to speak out. That's the end of the day. I love you guys. Thanks for sitting this patiently this long. And I'm open to the conversation. You guys go out. And like we end every week, go be the church. Salt and light, y'all. Have a great week.